Well, a very good morning. My name is Jagan Nasema Kwa Zikusoka on Good Morning Uganda Agenda on another day. It is the 13th of this month of, uh, month of May in this year 2020. Thank you so much for joining us uh, once again on this Wednesday morning. And uh, to you all, good morning Kampala, good morning Uganda, and good morning everybody. Who is staying safe, keeping safe, and of course are staying at home as we continue to count at the days too at the end of the lockdown as you again wait to hear from uh, His Excellency the President of Uganda to uh, give us a way forward. Now to all our brothers and sisters who are in the month of uh, Ramadan, we are still with you in prayer, praying for you. Uh, because it is the first time that you are um, actually going through uh, the fasting month um, in this manner like um, never before. Nonetheless, uh, lots of things are continuing to happen. And uh, this morning with me in studios is uh, Dr. Nathan Tumohamie. He's a, re a, a research fellow at uh, the University of Makere School of Public Health, but he's also uh, the director uh, for uh, Eastern Africa Resilience Innovation Lab. You're very welcome, uh, Dr. Nathan. Uh, thank you so much, Jagen, and uh, good morning, uh, uh, viewers. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Now, the bigger picture. Uh, what, what is the Resilience Innovations Lab, or what is the Resilience Africa Network? To start with, just give us a bigger picture of that. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the Resilient Africa Network is a network of uh, 20 African universities that mm -hmm. are working in 16 countries in Africa, uh, specifically to realize the innovations that are born out of the universities and are scaling these universities to address uh, development challenges within the community. Okay. So since 2012, uh, this uh, network has been operating across Africa as a continent, uh, operating in four regional centers, of which I'm head, uh, heading Eastern Africa. Okay. Uh, is it on at Macquarie University and or it's also with the other universities? It is with other universities, but the network is led by Macquarie University. Mm. And uh, it started with uh, funding from uh, USAID in 2012, mm. And since then, we have been able to develop over 500 innovations, mm -hmm. uh, most of which have been able to scale and are currently uh, being used to address development challenges across Africa. Okay. Now that the pandemic is here, COVID-19, uh, it has uh, challenged um, scientists and um, almost humanity uh, globally. Uh, there are lots of things happening, and uh, we've seen a number of uh, innovations also coming on. Now, just tell us what you have done, actually, at uh, Macquarie University, especially from uh, the Resilient um, Innovations Lab. What have you done to mitigate this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to also uh, join uh, in thanking His Excellency, the President, uh, for leading this fight uh, of um, uh, you know, COVID-19. You know he has been at, uh, a champion uh, in this. And uh, because of his leadership, Makerere also came in uh, with the leadership of uh, Professor Nawangu and Professor Bazeo, mm -hmm. they have been at the forefront of ensuring that innovations that address COVID-19 mm -hmm. are at the center of uh, you know, activities at the university. So uh, since then, we have been able to uh, develop quite a number of innovations, and I will mention uh, a number of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these innovations is uh, currently the ventilator. Mm -hmm. uh, the low-cost ventilator, you know, um, we know that... Uh, Currently, we have over 4.3 million uh, people who have uh, been infected by COVID-19. Globally. Globally. Mm. And uh, in Uganda, apparently, we have uh, 126 mm. people who have been uh, infected. Mm. But uh, without going into the statistics more, um, we know that people who are affected by this disease mm. actually have challenges in breathing. And for them to be able to breathe, uh, they need uh, these ventilators. Mm. And uh, the current ventilators on the market are very expensive. They cost about 90 million mm. to 100 pa, million pa, pa ventilator. Pa, pa ventilator. Mm. And each patient that goes into intensive care unit will require a ventilator. Mm. And we know that 5% of the patients of COVID-19, actually most of them require mm. uh, ventilators. So having take. seen that challenge, we at Makere University, working with the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovations mm. and Kira Motors Corporation, mm. uh, decided to get into this venture and designed a low-cost ventilator, mm. which is currently uh, undergoing tests in animals. Because mm. so we know that uh, this has to go through the life cycle of the product uh, development for medical devices. Mm. So this ventilator is currently uh, uh, going uh, tests in uh, animals, led by the uh, College of veterinary medicine. Uh, we anticipate this ventilator to cost as low as uh, between 1,000 and 5,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, why? Dollars. why yes, uh, dollars compared to the 5,000. If someone is only interested in a ventilator, 
without the accessories like uh, the gas cylinder, the solar system, because some of the facilities may not have electricity and therefore we require solar systems. Then the ventilator alone is like uh, we are looking at uh, this costing about 1,000 US dollars. But with accessories like uh, the gas cylinder, like uh, the solar system, that's why it is going to about uh, 5,000. And f of course it's because we are adapting the, uh, you know, the designs made by uh, MIT uh, and uh, University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And because these are materials that were developed to suit the U.S. setting, for us now we've identified materials uh, at Makere University working with several engineers mm -hmm. uh, from the College of Engineering, uh, Design and Art. We've been able to, you know, uh, identify the low-cost materials here in Uganda that we are translating to, devo uh, to design uh, mm. this ventilator. Uh, before you actually take me away from uh, that, uh, you, you talk about the low-cost ventilators. And um, one, um, we, we, many of us actually who are not in the medical practice or, or into that health field, we, we're just hearing about ventilators for the first time, the first time when uh, COVID is actually with us here. And, and now when you talk about low-cost ventilators, I talk about Kiramoto's and all the others. Now, Ugandans um, um, are, are very good innovators. We, we've seen them try making cars. We've been, seen them trying to, to, to make um, aeroplanes actually, and all the other things. But they are castigated uh, for you use uh, a, a, the other same equipment that uh, you, you get one old car. Uh, then you pull scrap from one car and then try to make another car. Now that means if the other car is not there, then you'll not be able to make your own here. Mm. Let's talk about the raw materials to start with. Where do you get the raw materials? Do you have them in this country? Uh, that will actually even be able to give us the low cost ventilator that you're talking about. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've seen that 78% uh, of the materials, about 78% uh, of the materials that we are using for this uh, ventilator mm -hmm. are actually available on the Ugandan market. Okay. These are some of the materials that we are getting fr from the local hardwares mm -hmm. because some of these uh, materials are the materials that we use, even some of them for the plumbing system. Mm. Some of these materials are, made, are wood. We have uh, quite a number of wood here mm. in Uganda. So it's only uh, the limited materials that we are importing, mm. uh, in addition to over 78% of the materials which we're acquiring from here. Mm. So that's why the cost is uh, uh, significantly low compared to if you imported uh, a, a ventilator from the U.S. or from Europe. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Nathan Tumohamie, um, just right there. Now, uh, with in studios um, is also Harriet Adonga, and she's the Director for Communications and Knowledge Management from uh, Resilient African Network, uh, School of Public Health, Macquarie University. You're also very welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, uh, you, you, you just got uh, Dr. Nathan Nia, actually trying to explain to us about the ventilators. Now, now that's one of the innovations that I think you have ma managed to get to. What other... Um, um, innovations um, uh, uh, did you pride about that um, you've actually put in place especially to mitigate uh, this situation okay thank you so much and thank you for hosting us this morning uh, like clearly said my name is Harriet Adong and I'm in charge of communication and knowledge management at the resilient Africa network which is a project within the School of Public Health at Makere University I'm so privileged to speak about the epitent the epitent is a tent that breathes. We as innovators, we as creative thinkers, put together ideas and improved the tent, the ordinary tents that exist. We put in breatherizers to make sure that the temperatures within the tents are actually permeable and acceptable for both health, health workers, but also for the patients within the tent. So this epitent is uh, currently in use in Ajumani district, which is one of the hottest districts in Uganda. Actually, it's the hottest district in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Hottest to mean what? Oh, hot the temperatures okay, are the quite temperature. high. Mm -hmm. And why we donated it to Ajumani Hospital mm -hmm. is because they were running short of space. Mm -hmm. They were running short of space uh, for their patients, and therefore they needed uh, extra space for them to be able to admit their patients, mm. especially the mothers who are giving birth. Mm. But alas, we received uh, a very enticing email mm. from the district health officer in Ajumani Hospital mm. that the epitent is now being used as an isolation center mm. for one of the cases that was confirmed 
in a, in a Jumani mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. So the epitent is what we pride in. Mm -hmm. We call it a tent that breathes mm -hmm. because it allows ambient temperature within the tent. Okay, so is, is this a tent that you're talking about? Yes, yeah. exactly. Now, now just look at its image there. Uh, yeah. Tell us how it actually works because some of us are actually seeing a house or a tent that is supposed to be in the bushes for the soldiers. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm. So the tent that you are looking at on the screen right now mm. is the epitent, an innovation from the Epi resident. Epitent mean what now? Epitent. Um, A-P-I um, then tent. tent. Mm. Yes. Why, we, why epitent now? For a, epidemic ten, tent or something? Exactly. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. mm. Because we originally came up with the idea to respond to the Ebola challenge. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so that Ebola epidemic that happened mm. um, some years ago, mm. this was the idea that came out, and then we improved it to make sure that you, when you're inside that tent, you feel cooler than even when you are outside in the normal environment. You made it here in Uganda? Yes, yes. we did it here in Uganda. Mm. It's currently being manufactured by Luero Industries yes. here in Uganda. Mm. And uh, amazingly, and if you look inside, mm. other than the beds, you can see that you can put up a drip mm. uh, for your patient. There are worktops if you need to work as um, a mm. person who is attending to the patient. But also the windows are wide enough for you to be able to see what is happening outside so that we fight social exclusion mm. for our patients who are in there, mm. so that we don't create anxiety. Mm. So that is the epitent in use in Germany right now as we speak. With only how many beds in it now? Uh, now this particular one 16. Um, had 16, 16 beds in mm. there. Mm. But the ones that we are manufacturing currently are take about 50 beds mm. yes so how many of these do you have do we have only this one that is in uh, a Germany or did there are several others no. I, I do not know Nathan yeah in fact in Germany we currently have uh, two tents mm. one is at uh, Germany uh, regional I mean uh, Ajuman district uh, hospital mm. Mm. and then the other is at uh, Aili uh, resettlement health center three yeah. so the one you saw uh, with the uh, patients is actually is uh, at uh, Aili mm. health center three and then uh, this is uh, the, the one you, yeah, you portrayed, the picture, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, at um, uh, Ajumani uh, Hospital, uh, which was used uh, to treat uh, the COVID-19 patient that was recently uh, confirmed in, uh, in, uh, in Ajumani. So this is currently uh, at Ajumani. So, so, you so be, be yes. besides that, we mm -hmm. have had uh, tents uh, in West Africa because we said this tent was initially designed for uh, isolation of uh, Ebola, uh, mm -hmm. patients. Ebola patients, but yeah. as you know, most of these uh, diseases behave alike, and, mm -hmm. and so they require uh, isolation mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, mitigate spread uh, to other people. Mm -hmm. And also, we do not want to contaminate our hospitals, mm -hmm. given that they also admit other patients. Mm -hmm. So, for that reason, the tent becomes the easiest way to deploy. They are very quick, mm -hmm. easy to deploy, but also provide the same service that would be provided within the health facility. Mm -hmm. Simply because this tent has been accessorized. It has provisions for the stand. It has provisions for a health worker, you know, to be able to uh, easily work by providing worktops. It, it, you know, it has a disinfecting channel within the tent. So it has been, uh, you know, uh, made in a way that uh, it provides the same uh, environment that you would get if you are in a health. Is facility. this the same tent that I also see? I think at Bombo Barracks. Uh, uh, is it the same that I saw the, the, so the UPDF talk about? Or the Bombo uh, Barracks uh, has used these ordinary tents, but uh, having realized the importance and the advantage with the EP tents, mm. they have now made orders. Uh, so far, we have ten uh, orders from uh, UPDF medical services. Mm. Uh, having seen how our tent performed in Ajumani, mm. they have been able to reach out to us, and uh, next week we shall be delivering uh, 10 tents to uh, the medical services of the UPDF. Yeah. We have quite a number of orders from other people. We have orders from uh, Absa Bank which has uh, donated tents to the four regional hospitals. So we shall be uh, installing these tents in uh, Mbale Regional Hospital, mm -hmm. in uh, Masaka Regional Hospital, Mbarara Regional Hospital, 
uh, and so um, uh, these are things that we no, are going no, no, to do. No, no, donating them specifically for COVID patients? For, co for, for, for COVID, isolation, uh, isolation, yeah, yeah for, for isolation, isolation yeah. Mm. Because uh, Uganda is currently uh, preparing itself. Mm. We do not have quite a number of cases. So far we have 126. Mm -hmm. But the country is uh, rethinking in terms of reopening. Mm -hmm. So we do not know, because from the studies we have seen, that countries that have been reopening mm -hmm. have had you know, an increase in the cases, again. a rebound mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So as a country, we need to prepare ourselves. In case that happens, mm -hmm. how do we improve our surge capacity to be able to respond mm -hmm. to the likely increasing number of cases if that happens? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially given that that issues of social distancing are likely to be minimized mm -hmm. compared to when people are still staying at home. Okay. And because we, the economy cannot continue in close and the country has to open up, mm -hmm. we also need to prepare ourselves. And that's exactly what even the head of state has been emphasizing, that mm -hmm. as a country we need to be ready mm -hmm. and make sure that we respond in the case we are overwhelmed by the numbers. Well, thank you so much. Now, Harriet, yeah. um, uh, Dr. Justin met it to us here, uh, the, the cost of a ventilator, uh, yeah. the traditional ventilator is that cost up to about 90 million Uganda shillings. That's too expensive for mm -hmm. um, um, any health facility to actually have a number of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talk about the low cost ones. What, what could be the cost of uh, this tent, um, especially for now, uh, uh, because we have those that they call the non for profit, I think, um, uh, facilities mm -hmm. that would possibly want to have these isolation centers also? What, what would be the cost of um, having a tent, an epi tent for them? So the, the cost of this tent is uh, uh, 25 to 30 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on the kind of accessories that you need. Because mm -hmm. as I said, it has accessories. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you're only going to use this tent just to isolate people who are under quarantine, for mm -hmm. example, you do not need the provisions uh, like uh, the drip stands and, and so on, uh, and therefore you, the accessories are minimized. So the cost will depend on the kind of services you want to use the uh, for the tent. Mm -hmm. But apparently for those that we are using uh, for healthcare service delivery mm -hmm. are costing between uh, 25 and 30 uh, million Ugandan shillings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, um, Harriet, uh, could you be knowing how many ventilators that we have in uh, different ICs? Because um, this is also a challenge now. He just talked about um, reopening. And yeah. um, according to the World Health Organization, um, if we are to reopen up, we just need to do it um, simultaneously and, and progressively to mm. ensure that uh, we actually manage uh, the resurgence of um, or the rebound of, mm. of, of, of the pandemic. That once it again breaks out, uh, it should find us more prepared than we were before. Yeah. And um, we, we've always, of, of course, seen that we do not have enough ICU beds, even when it's our prayer that mm. we actually do not get these very critical illnesses it, that take us to our ICUs. True, true. But, but how many ventilators, on, on average, could we be having in our different facilities that? Um, uh, uh, we are currently using, if you know. In Uganda, I've been following closely mm -hmm. about the ventilators because we are carrying out uh, the mm -hmm. development of the low-cost uh, ventilator, mm -hmm. and we actually have very few, about 50-something. 50 55. 55, yeah, mm -hmm. 55 overall. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we get so many patients that we need, need to be supported, mm -hmm. It would be a big disaster. Mm. And that's why we quickly thought about the low-cost ventilator. Mm. Because then it comes in to fill the gap that is already existing. Mm. You can imagine each referral hospital mm. actually needs to have not even 50 for each one of them. Mm. They need to have uh, possibly about 200 ventilators mm. just in case you have an epidemic or a pandemic that sweeps off everybody off their feet. Mm. So um, I think we are in dire need mm. for these ventilators mm. and for us to come up with a low cost one that is affordable almost for each and every health center would be a very good thing. Yeah, mm. think about the low cost itself as you talk about. Now we're trying to do the comparisons of mm. um, a ventilator that costs 90 million shillings mm. uh, to a ventilator that costs $1,000, which is less than 4 million shillings. Mm. We just looked at that uh, discrepancy. Um, uh, how sure are we that uh, this low cost ventilator will actually do what a 90 million ventilator does? Because um, uh, we tend to think maybe because these are going to be low cost, going to be cheap, then maybe the work is also going to be that cheap. No. To think yeah. that way. I don't I don't think so. Mm. You know why? Because throughout the innovation process we do a lot of testing, mm. testing and iteration. So we put out this particular innovation, mm. test it on dummy mm. instruments, mm. 
or what we call bench tests mm -hmm. to be able to see if it actually works and achieves what we do. And then thereafter, we move on to test on animals mm -hmm. before we actually test on a few patients mm -hmm. who are able to breathe mm -hmm. by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we test on critically ill uh, people mm -hmm. or patients. Mm -hmm. So the process is quite... Syn it, it's synchronological in it, it's in a certain order mm -hmm. that allows you to test at every stage to make sure that there is no hitch mm -hmm. to cause loss of life. Mm -hmm. But also, we have bodies that accredit these innovations. Very good. So before, assurances. Yeah, before mm -hmm. we get out there, we have to ensure that we have been checked, our ventilators have been properly accredited, the quality is thick, so that we do not cause any havoc to the patients. Mm -hmm. So before we roll them out, we go through that in the innovation ecosystem uh, processes, and then we are able to put out something that is actually reliable mm -hmm. to a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am not afraid T Take about me back that. a little. Mm. What are these ventilators and, and what do they do actually? Because um, we're now starting to imagine what these ventilators do so. and uh, does everybody require them anyway? Well, mm. We need to know. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much uh, and uh, thank you, Harriet. Mm. So uh, in a layman's language, mm. the ventilators assist in breathing. Mm. Uh, whenever there is a... External lungs, yes, for example. Uh, for mm. example, most times... Uh, we breathe free air because we are moving out and so on. So and because we, mm. because we are normal. Because we are normal. So um, most of the diseases, not only COVID, but mm. uh, all, uh, most diseases you've seen people say, oh, this one has been put on oxygen. Mm. Uh, so the ventilator allows someone to breathe. So that's assisted breathing. It provides that air that could have been provided uh, naturally if we are moving out mm. but because you're, you're sick and you're unable to breathe if you do not you know get this assisted breathing then you're going to die right away mm. so what the ventilators do mainly is to support breathing of the patients that are unable to breathe on themselves by themselves mm. so that's what the ventilator does okay. I just wanted to add on the issue of the quality assurance mm. uh, a, an advisory uh, committee has been uh, formed and uh, it has uh, all the necessary experts. We've uh, got an expert from the uh, medical school, uh, Makere University. We've got an expert from the National Drug Authority, uh, mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Health, and also from uh, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Mm -hmm. And before we do tests in human beings, we must get approval by the National Drug Authority. Mm -hmm. And at a later point, we shall also get uh, uh, the required approvals uh, from the international standards. Mm -hmm. So it will be a ventilator that will uh, meet the international standards and will be able to, uh, to be used uh, according to, you know, the state standards for using ventilators across uh, the world. And that's why we are going into that uh, process of the tabletop tests, the animal tests, then from the animals, then we go to the few human beings who are able to breathe, but you also want to see does it, you know, kind of interrupt with the normal breathing or it actually assists, and then you're able to, uh, to move uh, up to, you know, a level uh, where we are very sure that this is really a, a device uh, that will meet the standards uh, that are recognized internationally. Well, once you go through that um, uh, process, um, once you go through that um, uh, the, the rigorous exercise, because I think it's really rigorous to actually say uh, we've now uh, qualified this to be used uh, on human beings. Mm. Well, once you go through that uh, long process, what will it take uh, for us to have uh, many of those, for us to have more of those? Because I also need to know where you've now reached, how mm -hmm. far have you gone, uh, at what level are you? If you're supposed to walk 10 steps, mm -hmm. um, uh, at what step are you now? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as Aria said, we are the step of testing in animals. Mm -hmm. It took us uh, one week mm -hmm. to develop three ventilators that we are currently testing in okay. animals. Mm -hmm. So that means with mass production, we, we are even ha going to be having capacity to produce over 50 per week. Mm. So, and uh, with uh, more, you know, optimization, 
uh, we shall be able to do mass production because we are even exploring on who do we partner with. Once we have, uh, you know, the science done, then we start identifying who has the capacity to do mass uh, production. That's the same uh, approach we took when we are, uh, you know, uh, doing the mass production for the epitents. So we are able to, you know, to look at the existing, you know, manufacturers and identify the person uh, or the agency that has capacity to do mass production. So we are looking at actually in the future we want to be, you know, able to have a thousand plus uh, ventilators within uh, one month. Uh, and that's uh, what we are looking at. Given the capacity to produce three uh, within one week, when we are even doing these initial tests, okay. we think it will be uh, very much possible. I also want to say that uh, the resources that we are currently using have been provided by the government of Uganda. So this is funding that is ga ga coming from the government of Uganda mm -hmm. through the Research and Innovation Fund uh, of uh, Makerere University. Mm -hmm. So the government is very much in support of these uh, local innovations, mm -hmm. and we think with this continuous support, mm -hmm. we are going to you know, increase the surge capacity of the country to be able to respond mm -hmm. uh, to most of these uh, aspects that require you know, emergency response, that require even uh, response to other uh, challenges that the country might be going through. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nathan. Um, to you, Harriet, now, could you please just talk to us about the Akatalek app, because I think this is one of the other innovations that uh, you've also come up with. Uh, yes. Tell us about the Akatale app yes. and uh, how effective it's been uh, mm -hmm. to help us combat this thing that we're battling every day. Thank you so much. Uh, so the other innovation is the Akatale app. Mm. Like the name suggests, Akatale app. Akatale, app. Mm. Akatale in Luganda mm. is the market. Mm. So the Akatale app is one that you well, download. Why did you decide to use the Luganda word for Akatale? Well, we usually collaborate with the innovators, mm. innovators themselves, mm. to come up with these names. But the name should be aligned mm. to what your innovation is mm. actually going to address. Mm. So the name is linked to what solution you're providing. Mm. So we guide them through the process of coming up with these names. Mm. And uh, Akatale app... No particular reason, but because Akatale is market mm. and the app is And the assumption is we all know what Akatale is. No, we, we usually describe it. We mm. describe it. We, okay. we, we aim to describe it, especially when we are engaging with new clients or mm. when we are engaging with people who might not know. Mm. For example, USID, our mm. donors might not easily know what Akatale, uh, what Akatale is. So mm. we describe to them that Akatale is a market, meaning mm. market. Okay. So the Akatale app is downloadable mm. off uh, your Google Play Store, mm. and you install it on your phone, and you're able to order for fresh deliveries, deliveries of food, mm. fresh vegetables, uh, fresh food, fish, chicken, mm. cucumber, you know, green pepper mm. from the market. Mm. All the groceries in the market find you at mm. your home or at your place of convenience. Mm. So when you look at uh, the screen right now, mm. that is the Akatale, in, Akatale Innovation or the Akatale app, or we also call it the Akatale Fresh mm. because they deliver fresh groceries mm. right mm. from the market to your home. Mm. So what you do, you download it. After downloading it, you can order for whatever you want. There is a list of uh, items within uh, the app. You order for whatever foodstuffs you want to have, mm. and then you place your location, and then that is delivered to wherever you are. Mm. So currently, this has helped a lot of people, especially after the lockdown. Mm after we were asked to stay home, mm. after we were asked not to move around, mm. you can't go to the market. Mm. It's a quick way for you to be able to make your orders and they are delivered at home and they are superb. Mm. You know, it's as if I have been to the market myself to mm. pick the groceries. Mm. Yeah, I have had a chance to um, actually use them. Mm. I live You've in used Nalia. The app I've yeah. used the app myself mm. and I live in Nalia. I ordered for my groceries. I have mm. quite a big family mm. so I needed quite a lot to take me through the week. Mm. And alas, the packaging was superb. The, the greenness and freshness of the vegetables was as if I was in the market myself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so they deliver to your house and you cut away from being able to move around to contract the COVID virus or the, any other diseases along the way. Mm. So they deliver right to your doorstep. Mm. 
and uh, make your life a little easier mm. given that we are constrained uh, moving around. Some of us are not IT savvy and, and we, we basically don't know many of these IT things mm. e e except the basic things that, that we know. Now, mm. when you get to that app and uh, possibly try to make the orders, uh, do you have a choice of a catalog that you go to or it is just you just order for, for, for groceries? Uh, and they come from anywhere uh, because I need to know whether uh, uh, I have a choice to actually say my groceries should come from this particular Katali mm. or it, they just come from anywhere for as long as they are what I've ordered for. No, you know, each one of us has preferences. Mm. So your groceries can come from Nakasero mm. a market, mm. they can come from mm. Nakawa market, mm. they can also come from Kalere market. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, we take pride and uh, we really love to deliver to the customer mm. to meet their need. Mm. So uh, and maybe proximity also because yeah. um, if, if I'm in Mulago yeah. and uh, there's the Kalere market, I, I don't see reason why my groceries should actually come from Nakawa. I'm only thinking. I don't know. Well, sometimes. Uh, I live in Nalia, but my groceries come from Nakawa market. Yes, that's okay. Yes, but, yes. but I stay in Entebbe. Why, why would my groceries come from Nakawa market if I stay in Entebbe? No, that wouldn't be necessary. It wouldn't be, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so... Mm. That also can come into play. You mm. could give us your preference of the market, given that you are aware of what you need, mm. and we go by that. Actually, the niche that Akatale is trying to bring in place mm. is the fact that they want to meet the customer's needs mm. to the dot. Mm. They don't want to leave out anything, any stone unturned. Mm. They want to deliver to you, and you don't have regrets. Mm. You don't have to say, Oh, I wish I had gone to the market myself. Mm. Yeah, so that is the difference that Akatale has put mm. in place. D D Dr. Nathan, um, uh, COVID-19, I think, has actually now uh, brought out the best in you are the scientists. And uh, I think that's why President Museven is every day actually thanking you and talking these very good things about you because I think now mm. that we, we can see where science is taking us. Mm. Do you have any other innovations? We've now seen the ventilators. We've seen uh, the epitents. We've seen uh, the, the Akatale app. app yeah. What are the things that you're actually coming up with? Uh, because we're now looking to you for innovations. Yeah, yeah mm. thank you so much. It's quite a number of them actually. So um, I will uh, specifically speak about uh, the uh, personal protective equipment. The PPEs. The PPEs. And that's actually coming to that because exactly. that's very important. It's understand. very important. The mm. president has emphasized this, has talked about it. Mm. I want to say that this is one of the products we are currently producing, mm. uh, working with uh, the College of Engineering, Art and Design, uh, mm. said that. Said that. We've been mm. able to do uh, a study on uh, materials that are able to give us the best uh, PPEs, mm. and uh, we've finalized this process. Uh, we've uh, finalized, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, we, we now know the kind of materials we need. Uh, we have materials for reusable PPEs and materials for disposable uh, PPEs. So we, we, we are going to be manufacturing both. Uh, you even heard the president speak about Professor Baze as one of the people who is uh, uh, supporting this process of manufacturing PPEs. And this was out of uh, the intense engagements that we've had with the scientists at the university to be able to critically study the adequate materials. First of all, those that are available in the Ugandan market, mm -hmm. but also those that meet the international standards for the PPEs. Mm -hmm. So we have now uh, been having discussions with uh, the uh, Kapeka Industries, uh, as well as uh, the industry that is working on uh, on, uh, on uniforms, UPDF uniforms. The NITIP. Yes, the NITIP, to agree uh, on uh, on mass production. Because apparently we've been uh, using the local artisans and uh, their capacity is actually limited in terms of uh, mass production. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are looking at now uh, establishing ourselves uh, with uh, more uh, production capacity to make sure that we respond to uh, the current need. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, finalized this. In fact, we've also been uh, uh, in discussions with uh, DFID Uganda, uh, which has uh, indicated that they will actually be supporting uh, mass production of over 100,000 PPEs so that we are able to uh, provide uh, more PPEs to the market. One of the biggest challenges we've been having, especially with the health workers, uh, was more related to uh, availing these protective wares uh, for them to be able to uh, protect themselves against the, the spread. So that's why we were very fast to study the materials and be able to come up with the best uh, that we could offer to this country. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. these are going also, these are, are going to be on the market and uh, 
we are sure that this is going to now uh, allay the, fe uh, the fears that health workers had in terms of uh, protecting themselves. We, we are going to be producing both uh, reusable and, and, and disposable PPEs, mm -hmm. uh, but the price is going to be, uh, uh, to be uh, different. Mm -hmm. And we are also looking at uh, between 100,000 and 120 mm -hmm. per PPE. Uh, the current uh, PPEs on the market are costing us 200,000 to 250. So, just so we st again, for, because that's the importance of innovations. We study the materials, mm -hmm. we get the exact quality, mm -hmm. but we make sure that we minimize on the cost. Okay. We are also aware that we are operating uh, in a limited resource country, mm -hmm. uh, also even as a region, and therefore we need to uh, operate within such environments to make sure that whatever we are doing is cost effective and it meets the standards and the quality. So, so what's the complete required. gear now of the PPEs that we talked about? The, the, so those that cost, uh, those that will cost 100 and 120,000. It's the, the gear. Things? So it, it's a dress. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a suit. Mm. It's a, that's what we call it, we call it hazmat suit. So mm. it's a suit that will have a wearable for the whole body, mm. but to also have uh, 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 a hood, a hood, a hood yeah. which I uh, will cover. And then we are also thinking of. Uh, we've been having a discussion of adding a, a face mask. Mm. Uh, which will be able even to cover the face so that the whole uh, the health worker is completely protected. Yeah. So this is the, 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 the PPE that we are talking about. We've seen about. some actually putting on things that are like glasses. Exactly. They're just like glasses before them. They're like helmets, but, mm -hmm. but then it, it's just, um, not, it doesn't cover the whole head, but we've, we've seen those. Are, are they real glasses? Is it plastic? Is it what? Are we, what are these things? It varies. Mm -hmm. uh, and also you look at the cost. Mm -hmm. If you had uh, enough resources, uh, then you could do glass. glass. Yeah. But you know the, the the PPE when you're designing the, the hazmat suit mm. you also need to think about the comfort of health worker okay. who is going to be using this for quite a long time mm. so you also think about is the glass most uh, you know effective for this health worker mm. or I can even look for a plastic one mm. which is lighter for this health worker, mm -hmm. but also provides comfort for this health worker. So mm -hmm. all those are part of the design, you know, specifications that we go through mm -hmm. when we are having these discussions. And that's why you need to engage the health workers too, because you are not designing for people who are going to be seeing this on TV or what, mm -hmm. but you are designing a product that is going to be used by health worker, and therefore a health worker should be able to. Uh, provide feedback mm. in terms of how comfortable the person uh, is while putting on this uh, protective equipment. Okay. Yeah. And this is exactly what we've been going through for the last period to make sure that the materials that are available in the Ugandan market actually suit the needs of the health workers mm. so that once we do the production the health workers are very much comfortable with what is produced. Yeah. Do you want to add on something? Yes, I wanted, PPEs? thank you so much. Mm. I wanted to add on the fact that we actually engage with the end user when we are coming up with these innovations. Mm -hmm. Like for the PPE, glass, non-glass, I think also issues of security mm -hmm. or durability. Mm -hmm. Because if then a glass falls down by accident, mm -hmm. then exactly. you lose that. Mm -hmm. So maybe a plastic is mm -hmm. better. But also, since the protective personal equipments usually cover the head, mm -hmm. we've gone ahead to engage with most of the females most of us usually have mm. bulky hair mm. and you want to be within the protective unit with mm. your hair. You don't want to compromise your look. Mm. So we have taken care of that too to make sure that the hoodie is able to cover mm. up my hair, not without destroy it you. without inconveniencing me. Mm. But also my shoes. Mm. Yeah, many of well, us... It even goes up down. Yeah, yeah, many of us put on mm. high, high heel shoes, yes, exactly. pointed shoes, mm. and uh, we have taken care of that too, mm. because then you want the health worker or whoever is using the PPE to actually be as comfortable mm. as I am, mm. the way I am dressed in my mm. ordinary or standard mm. wear. Okay. So that is very important. Mm. The back and forth with the end user mm. to make sure that you actually meet the needs of the end user okay. is something that is very <laughs> critical. In very important. Now, the other thing also is uh, when we got the uh, Ebola um, outbreak in uh, 2000, 2001, we lost so many people, and mm. that, that's why the fatality rate of Ebola was so high compared yeah. to uh, COVID-19 here. Uh, in Uganda, we had the problem that uh, we uh, didn't have the capacity to test for Ebola. And um, I had the president say we had to carry our samples to take them to South Africa. But over the years, we've actually now improved that uh, we have a very good and strong um, uh, institute, uh, UVRI in Entebbe, that can actually do these testing. 
questions. We heard from the experts that uh, it is costing us uh, 65 US dollars, which is about 250,000, uh, to do uh, these um, uh, COVID tests. And uh, we think that's too expensive because mm. uh, when you uh, get the samples that they've so far tested and um, how much it costs, we think, yes, it's, it's very terrible. And uh, we're also told um, the testing is similar to the testing of HIV AIDS. It's similar to the testing of uh, uh, um, hepatitis uh, and, and all these others. Are you thinking testing kits or so, which could also uh, lower the cost from 250000 per test to maybe something that is affordable for our health systems and country? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very, very critical question. And uh, you've heard uh, that even the National Task Force has been really uh, thinking much about testing. And uh, that has been the talk of the nation uh, for the last, you know, two, three months. So uh, I must say that uh, <coughs> because it has been a need for everyone, uh, the university, specifically Makere University, has not been, you know, seated. They have been thinking through this process. How do we provide, you know, our expertise in addressing this need uh, of providing the testing kits? So Professor Joroba uh, and the team uh, at the College of Health Sciences have actually been, uh, you know, um, coming up with low-cost uh, tests which they are thinking of making between uh, one to three dollars uh, in terms of uh, you know testing, uh, which reduces from 65 to that's, about that's three dollars. So the initial tests uh, were actually done. It, it has also gone through the, the, the initial processes, and uh, we we are now getting to a level uh, where possibly now they need to get into the certification process. Mm -hmm. And once this meets the, the certification standards this should be on the market. But the university actually has been uh, working very hard. We've seen Professor Nawangwe uh, talk about this several times, uh, but this is uh, led by uh, Professor Joroba, uh, who is uh, uh, the, uh, actually currently the, the acting uh, principal, principal of the College of uh, Health Sciences. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we really see this as a very critical need uh, for this country, and uh, we are working with the stakeholders to make sure that we come up with it, uh, the testing kits uh, that are low cost and meet the, 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 the context that we are operating in. Mm -hmm. uh, I know also the, the heads of state in, in the region, uh, East African uh, heads of state, have also had a lot of discussions on how they can uh, you know, facilitate the process of having low cost testing kits mm -hmm. and of course other equipment uh, that could be used for addressing uh, the, the gap that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So this is an area that uh, we are thinking about and we have actually moved to an advanced stage at the university mm -hmm. and we hope uh, in the near future possibly within one month, mm -hmm. we should be having uh, the testing kits. Uh, across the globe in Africa, actually, there are a number of countries that have had uh, the initial designs of the testing kits uh, mm -hmm. costing about $1, and we think uh, this is very, very much possible. Mm -hmm. We also need to know that COVID-19 is a new disease, and therefore, there are quite a number of you know, scientific studies that need to be undertaken okay. to be able to come up with the right uh, you know, equipment, the right devices that should be used, mm -hmm. because we've also had some heads of state disputing the kind of testing, testing kits, kits that, they have, that exactly. are on the market. So mm -hmm. that also from the scientific perspective, mm -hmm. it gives us a lot of research questions in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, how we should answer questions that are coming from mm -hmm. uh, these heads of state and mm -hmm. also other from stakeholders. From the politicians, yes. Yeah, sure. so that's very critical in terms of what do we need to do to ensure that we are, you know, having the kind of devices that meet the standard that we, we need. Okay. But that's also an aspect. That okay. We well, I want to thank you so much. Our time has run out. Um, uh, Harriet, uh, what, what's your final message to the people um, in regards to what is happening and uh, what do you think is, is that thing that if you only had one opportunity to sell to the public, uh, that's yeah. what you would have said? Thank you so much. My one thing to the public is that let's continue to be creative. Mm. Let's think out of the box. Mm. You can imagine a list of all these innovations that we have. Mm. We are incubating over 350 multidisciplinary innovative solutions, all by Ugandans. Mm. It is therefore very important for all of us to continue to be innovative, continue to be creative, not to think just within your box. Think of what you can do to support or to address a challenge that is happening within your community. Just before I conclude, I want to highlight one small innovation, not very small, but one that is relevant to the current situation, the Centers for Her. 
application. It's centers for? Centers for her. H-E-R? H-E-R. Mm. You know now domestic violence and mm. violence against women and girls is on the increase mm. because we are all locked down at home. Mm. So we also have the Centers for Her mm. app. Mm. You just download it. Eventually, off, I should also think Google about store. Centers for Him. Centers I mean, for me, Him. Me and Nathan will yes. think about Centers for Him. <laughs> I think that is very important. Yeah. yeah. And then you're able to report mm. that you have actually been assaulted mm. or you have been beaten mm. or you need help from a health center okay. or you need uh, assistance to be, to, mm. to be rescued mm. from violence. So you download it off, off the Google Store and you're able to use it to reach out to these health fa facilities. Mm. It's something that innovators together with us came up with okay. and it is in use right now okay. for us to try and curb violence against women and mm. girls. So ladies and gentlemen, let's all try to think broadly, mm. think outside the box. Mm. It's possible. Okay. We can innovate and address our own challenges. Well, I want to thank you so much, Harriet mm. Adong, uh, the uh, Director of Communications and Knowledge Management uh, from um, the Resilient African, African Network, a school of public health, Macquarie University. Hey, Dr. Nathan, yes. uh, to Mohamed, your, your final take in just one and a half minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. My final take is that uh, solutions to address any challenge in this country mm. will not come from anywhere else other than this country. Very good. And we still have, uh, we know we have the capacity as a country. The, our young people, uh, both within the university and outside the university, mm. uh, have proved that they have the potential and the capacity to do this. Mm. And I'm happy that the government of Uganda has also come up to support this process. Mm. Some of these innovations we are talking about are entirely supported by government of Uganda. Mm. Ministry of ICT, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovations, mm. and even the government itself, the State House. So we think that with the capacity that we have within our young people in this country, mm. we shall be able to address the development challenges in this country. Okay. And that's the direction, actually, the even the president himself is taking, mm -hmm. supporting the young people in this country, supporting the country to be the solution to the challenges that are affecting the country. Okay. I think we can do it as a country, and we should strive to make sure that our people in this country innovate enough to address the challenges the country is facing. And uh, I want to also thank the university management mm -hmm. for championing and supporting the innovation ecosystem, okay. specifically Makere University. And we promise as a university, mm -hmm. as a network, a resilient Africa network, which is bringing together universities mm -hmm. across the region, mm -hmm. we are ready to work with the rest of the universities in the country and in the region mm -hmm. to make sure that we build the capacity of these institutions to be able to come up with innovations that address the development challenges. Okay. Because we have quite a number of innovations Okay. that are going on. The Uganda, the, the, the Uganda media, uh, you know, literacy is coming up with an innovation on which information should we put to the public using the online media platforms. Mm -hmm. So we have those innovators who are even thinking about the kind of information sure. that should go out. Okay. This is m here, uh, this is by Ugandans here. Mm -hmm. We have a number of innovations for addressing issues of quarantine. How do you manage information in quarantine and so on. Okay. So Ugandans are really having this capacity and we should all support uh, this process to make sure that we address uh, the challenges that are facing this country. Well, I want to thank you so much, Nathan, and uh, to Mohamie, uh, from Akai University, from uh, uh, Resilient um, Innovations Lab, Resilient Africa Network. Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you so much, Harriet, for also joining me. Thank and uh, you. thinking as a Ugandan and thinking as an African, I, I think you deserve all our support because I also want to think uh, Ugandan solution, African solution to our problems. Yeah. Well, to our viewers out there, thank you so much for being part of the program here on Good Morning Uganda Extra. My name is Jagenda Semakola Zuksoka. We will end this year, and we now welcome you to our classes that are coming. Coming on live on TV here. Stay blessed. Good morning and bye for now.